welcome to another episode of the Minute Works Conversations of Change series. The guest we are hosting today is an important voice of inclusion in the public health space in India. We are happy to welcome Deepika Saluja, who is a program manager at the George Institute for Global Health, India. She holds a PhD in public health policy from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, with an interdisciplinary background in science, management, and policy degrees. Her interests span across different areas of public health with an extensive focus on healthcare for the frontline workers, sexual and reproductive health, menstrual and mental health, and universal health coverage. Deepika holds widespread experience in consulting with various national and international development sector organizations. And uh, she is also the co-founder and the current chair of Women in Global Health India, a movement built on advocating gender equity in global health leadership and amplifying the voices of women health workers across the country. Welcome Deepika. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Matangi. Um, really a pleasure to be here. Before we move on, Deepika, to the critical themes like uh, women in healthcare, women's leadership, why don't we set the stage for today's conversation by getting to know your journey a bit? Uh, we are very curious about your interdisciplinary exposure and expertise. Could you please share how you discovered your interest in public health policy? The journey started on a actually sad note. Uh, so I was a bit apprehensive of starting the conversation on that. But um, anyway, so um, actually, um, I have uh, all the degrees that I've been, uh, I have done, like I started my career with a BSc, then an MBA, and then a PhD. And actually, my journey is a classic example of not having any mentor. Uh, I, I saw somebody doing a BSc. I went and enrolled myself in a B, BSc program. During my BSc program, I saw somebody giving an exam for MBA. I, I wrote the exam. I cleared it. I went for an MBA program. And then um, after MBA, I saw somebody writing for PhD programs. I was like, I also want to do it. So it was like uh, not having anybody to speak to. Uh, but... Um, also, uh, going for PhD program, what exactly, you know, I want to study. And around that period of time, I had a actually a kind of depressing incident that we uh, lost one of our family members to the private interest of um, a hospital. So he was in ICU for around two weeks and he got subsidized care because uh, of the amazing work that he has done in the legal uh, support space. He, he was uh, an amazing advocate. And um, because of that, um, Im imagine an ICU bed in a hospital like Max. Um, at a subsidized rate for the hospital and for the doctors, uh, it actually turns out to be that they see the opportunity cost of that ICU bed more than the life of an individual, right? Eventually, um, we, we got to know that one, one uh, night we were just told when we were in the hospital that we've lost him two years after he had his last breath. So um, it, it really shook us. Um, and my family was not in the state to, to actually question or think uh, beyond that they've lost their family member. Uh, but I was reflecting on that, what exactly happened? And I was too young um, to uh, to question, no knowledge of public health space, no knowledge of social sector, no knowledge of how hospitals or doctors function. But I could very clearly see huge information asymmetry and over-reliance of citizens as patients and as caregivers on the doctors and hospitals and this whole healthcare provider setup, and also the the disempowered position of citizens that that because we don't know um, uh, our rights, what do we fight for? Who do we fight against? Uh, what are the channels? What are the mechanisms through which we can actually exercise our right? So that triggered the curiosity to understand what is happening on the other side. Um, I mean, it, it, it 
kind of triggered that inquiry in my head and I have been a very curious person. So it's just like I followed my uh, instinct and I applied for a PhD program in my SOP. I wrote this whole narrative that, you know, I want to understand the other side. So that's how I, I entered into a PhD in public health policy. And since then, as um, I got, you know, more and more understanding of the space, I, I don't know, it's it's actually not very uh, pleasant to understand that how the space operates, right? Uh, how the power dynamics and how these different stakeholders engage and um, uh, how certain population groups are at a disadvantage, women, girls, um, you know, uh, people from marginalized communities, citizens um, uh, from, uh, you know, specific background who do not have that much knowledge or understanding of their rights and we keep on um, uh, saying that as a citizen you should be empowered to to fight for your right but then do we empower citizens that way so how uh, just to make sense of this this is how I mean it just panned out one after the other and now um yeah, I'm integrating my knowledge and understanding with gender because uh, also came along a lot of reflections on uh, gender, my reading and also amazing uh, work that we are doing as part of Women in Global Health um, India chapter. Deepika, it's very unfortunate that uh, you had to go through such an adverse experience personally in order to understand your space professionally. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we are sure this must have not been a simple and an easy thing to process. And also through that, you highlighted the challenges and confusion one has to go through when they do not have a solid mentor to rely on academically or professionally. That is one of the key areas that we are also aiming to solve for. Since you brought up that in public health space, uh, it is not generally a very pleasant place to be. And also, since you know the workings of it, the challenges it poses to the citizens and also the emotional toll it takes on the frontline workforce, most of which are women. And uh, considering your own nature of work where you deal with all sorts of uh, stakeholders day in and day out, uh, I'm sure that has its own emotional repercussions. So we want to know how do you manage to maintain your emotional well-being and uh, balance your professional responsibilities? This question holds particular significance because as women, we often bring empathy and compassion to our work. How do you extend that compassion to yourself and ensure self-care while striving to make a positive impact in the very critical areas of work that you manage? Actually, that's a very difficult question to answer, but also a very important question to ask, uh, you know, which often gets missed out in the conversations when we talk about our professional journeys. And I wouldn't deny that I have been, I have not been on the, on the kind of bad side of it. Uh, in this age, almost every other person is dealing with, um, you know, some of the common mental health disorders like stress, anxiety, depression, um, and especially working within this space um, uh, for nearly a decade now, and particularly in the last few years of the pandemic, being part of the studies where I've heard you know, tragic stories of suffering, death, domestic violence, and early uh, girl-child marriage, it really does get sometimes challenging to just get back to the normal life and, and get going. Um, and more so when we were encounter encountering similar situations in our own families and friend circle, right? I mean, uh, the, the uh, last year I was supporting a couple of uh, my uh, friends and uh, cousins who were dealing with the emotional trauma of a difficult marriage or a separation. So the, providing that kind of support where while I want to be there for them all the time, providing that kind of support, uh, whatever little in my capacity that I can, but it it really drains out a lot of energy um, from you. It, it uh, makes you feel very, very exhausted. And then, um, you know, as a woman, with personal family issues. It's been two years that I've been married and I'm 36 now. So you can imagine, you know, um, the pressure that I have, um, you know, to reproduce and plan my family because of the biological clock, etc. I mean, you put all this together because this is reality. I mean, I wanted to bring out these different aspects because many women um, uh, would uh, relate to these experiences because 
they are in situations like these. So you put all these, the, these things together, many days you're not left with anything inside you to pass through the day, right? I mean, I'm learning to deal with my stress and as a woman experiencing gender ex gender challenges within the professional spaces, which are many times invisible to others, uh, most of the times, and a lot of these issues were brought up in the conference also last week, right? Um, so one has to be creative and find out own ways uh, to relieve stress and uh, there's no one right way um, but uh, I mean personally what I did was um, uh, I started journaling I started writing my own thoughts uh, that helped me uh, sometimes unwind uh, some some days I color some days I just sit and absorb some days I cry um, you know, if there's anything specific that is bothering me, I also turn out to uh, turn to my communities of support. Um, I, I think in one of the conversations, one of the interviews uh, for women at work, when I, I was having interaction with your team, I mentioned that um, you know, a couple of months back, I got trolled for raising concern uh, on a manual of eight on developing sustainable cities. So I was wondering, how do you develop sustainable cities without including the voices of women? And this, this conversation happened in one of my alma mater's PhD graduate WhatsApp group. Um, it, it turned out to be so toxic. I mean, the amount of hatred and bullying that I experienced, I never experienced before. It, it completely shook me up. But like, how did I recover? I turned out to my women in global health community, my India chapter community. They not only just, uh, you know, gave me that confidence that yes, I'm on the right path and, you know, questioning these regressive norms. And we're talking about questioning it in, in an educated elite community. Right. If they are not able to understand, how are we going to engage with the other uh, groups of people? Um, and and then I also wrote a reflective piece on that. So I also write um, articles based on my personal reflections on what I'm feeling and what I'm finding challenging. And what does it say about the larger society and the global health space? So that gives all that also gives me a sense of freedom to share it with the wider world. And then people relate to those experiences. And then you find strength in in shared uh, experiences in shared stories. So yeah. I mean, uh, everybody has different ways, but uh, it's just that one has to find. And, and I should also um, uh, kind of um, admit that I haven't had the courage to go to therapy yet, which I a lot of people have been telling me that, you know, there are signs and you should seek therapy. So it, it's a journey when um, everyone has to find out their own way. People say that I am oversensitive. Earlier, I used to feel very, very insecure about it because I would feel really things deeply. And, you know, one incident would take me two weeks back. And now I'm trying to kind of accept it and embrace it. So I don't know, like I'm still on my exploring journey, finding my ways, but yeah, little things that I can do that that makes me feel a bit relieved. Yeah. Thank you for having that vulnerable conversation on turning to your community and support system during stressful times. It's very refreshing to hear a leader acknowledge the importance of non-judgmental spaces where women can admit their stress and challenges instead of always feeling the need to act tough and uh, put on a mask. It resonates deeply with women at work because we are working towards building similar communities and forums to encourage such conversations. I was also intrigued by your mention of uh, the toll the pandemic took on you, considering the demanding workspaces you navigate. How did you manage to find the bandwidth both emotionally and time-wise to start the India chapter of Women in Global Health in between a global health crisis? I can only imagine the energy and uh, the sort of uh, preparation it must have taken. So uh, could you please share your experience and uh, how you navigated through the situation? I'll tell you one one statement that I, I want to make up front and I'll come back to that statement again and you would see why is that um, had it not been Women in Global Health India chapter, I wouldn't have survived the past few years of, uh, you know, horrifying incidents that I've had in my personal and professional spaces. So, um, uh, I mean, whatever fulfillment that I've got over the past few years and that I'm surviving and in a way maybe thriving, I don't know, uh, 
uh, is because of the uh, WGH India chapter. I would really want to um, credit the experiences and the journey that how it how my career has shaped up, how my experiences have shaped up. Uh, so we started actually Women in Global Health um, India chapter uh, conversation started back in January 2019. And we were reflecting on that. What is it that we need to do differently? There are a lot of organizations that are working within the space of gender that are working at the intersection of gender and health, right? We don't want to duplicate the work that already existing organizations are doing, but there has to be something that is missing that we can bridge the gap. And we spoke to a lot of people, seniors, um, women leaders uh, within India, outside India to understand that what is it that we can meaningfully contribute to. And we were uh, eventually from the conversations, it was uh, coming out that a lot of these pieces of work on gender, on gender and health and so many other social determinants are actually happening in silos. And one way would be to bridge the conversations and to bring the stakeholders together and also amplify the work that they are doing and then the pandemic hit. So just when we registered registered in the sense that when we signed the MOU with the global team and the chapter became an official chapter and we were about to get start uh, started with the activities, uh, we had the pandemic in front of us and we saw a range of frontline health workers, you know, stepping out of their way, going out of their way to, to do and support the community to help um, in the uh, India's COVID response strategy. And it was amazing to see how much effort they were putting in. And you would see that why they were largely women. It was kind of uh, strange, um, satisfying, but also ironic in a way that, um, and that is when we felt like, you know, frontline health workers, uh, they have been doing this amazing work since, you know, decades and even um, longer than that, but they've never got the recognition and um, the value that they have been putting into kind of keeping the health system survive amidst these adversities, right? So that is when we realized that we need to do something related to amplifying their work. We just started a series on ASHA workers connecting different stakeholders. Um, and uh, we received a lot of, uh, you know, interest on, okay, let's do it for nurses and midwives. Let's collaborate to do it for self-help groups. Let's collaborate to do it for allied health professionals. So that's how it just picked up because people connected with the narratives that these frontline health workers shared themselves. So it wasn't like their voices were mediated by somebody they were coming on the platform sharing their uh, stories in their voices with their faces so that brought a lot of strength to the uh, to building and shaping that narrative and amplifying their um, contributions but also challenges because they were still working in resource constraint settings and uh, suddenly the working setup has changed. The uh, instructions are coming in an ad hoc way. PPP equipments are not adequate and um, allocated very scatteredly. So a lot of issues were brought into the attention and that's how actually WGH India got the um, uh, traction and also the value that it contributed to in shaping the discourse for frontline health workers. And then it went on and on. Uh, we did a series for women and children. We did a series for so many other uh, carders. And um, it really helped us shape the um, conversation around um, the contribution of women. But also, uh, I think what is critically important here is that I want to bring this up is that we were building a movement based on voluntary contribution. And it is important to note that, you know, when we are in the global health space, we're talking about women getting, uh, women are largely unpaid or underpaid for their contribution. If we look at the global health system, 70% of the healthcare workforce is employed in the lowest cadres of the um, healthcare workforce. And as we go up in the hierarchy, we see less and less women and only 25% or in some countries, even less than 25% of the executive positions are held by women. So um, when we're talking about this narrative and building a movement on voluntary contribution, it had its 
own positives, but also negatives. That how much can we rely on voluntary contribution? When we are committed, we want to support, right? I have been, and along with me, all my co-founding team members have been working for past four or five years all on voluntary basis. It's like, you know, kind of running uh, an organization on a part-time basis, building an organization, right? I am personally, I'm doing it because I'm committed and I see, um, you know, my fulfillment of my life professionally and personally through WGH India. But at some point of time, we would want to change that, right? Because it's, it's contradictory that when we are saying that women should be paid equally, and on the other hand, we are kind of um, pushing for more and more voluntary work, right? So that came as a very, very big learning for us that when we are saying that we need to stand strong on values, we have to prove it by our actions, by the work that that we do. And that is one of the most important part of the growth, especially when you're building something um, uh, from ground up in the current times when everybody is talking about equity and social justice. How do we integrate that? The existing organizations, if we question the inequitable practices that are there in the existing long founded, you know, established organizations, it's like um, kind of changing, not only just changing the status quo, but actually turning systems upside down, right? But when we have the opportunity to start something from scratch, from ground, there we see the opportunity of integrating those values of equity and social justice and how what we keep on talking in those uh, conferences, how we actually do that on ground in the work that we do. So that is one of the important things that uh, we have learned and also um, that uh, money is important to run a movement and to actually um, get going because uh, we cannot continue kind of um, utilizing free labor. That is the most uncomfortable thing that I feel um, that I, I should be um, a, as, uh, you know, the co-founding uh, member and also as the leader for India chapter, I should be in a position that if I'm asking somebody for support, I should have something to provide in return. Uh, I should be able to compensate um, fairly. So that th these are a couple of uh, points that came out very, very strongly, but also building a community of support. And as I shared earlier, you know, WGH India, as well as the global community, it building a community of support, uh, it pays you back beyond what you can expect. So it is, I think this is what will help us uh, thrive through different difficult times. Yeah. You just touched upon one of the concerns I wanted to address, which is the presence of numerous women frontline workers and the persistence of unpaid labor, which is not simply a coincidence. Now, moving on to the other concern, I would like to delve into the challenges faced by women leaders in this space. Considering you brought up funding, let's specifically focus on that aspect uh, could you share your insights on the ease or the difficulty of seeking funding opportunities as the chair of uh, wgh india what have been uh, some of the learnings as you navigate the funding landscape in your role so i mean honestly in terms of funding so far uh, whatever um, little support that we've got is through the global team or through uh, the grants that global team was able to get for some of the country chapters. So currently we're working on a grant for integrating gender equity into UHC. So through that grant, we're able to um, <clears throat> employ two people as part of the team who would then work on um, uh, taking that um, grant work forward, but also building the chapter. And most importantly, we had requested that, you know, we would want to use this as an opportunity to build our capacity to raise more funds so that by the time this grant ends, we are in a position to have more grants coming in and we can employ more people and we can provide financially support uh, people who are contributing to building the chapter, but also, um, you know, create a model of sustainability in a way that takes the work forward because there are numerous ideas. When we have our members call, a lot of our members share such passionate um, ideas that they are uh, that is coming from their own lived experiences and they're really enthusiastic and passionate about taking that forward but then 
we don't have the resources to support them many times, right? So how do we do that? So these are the learnings that we are having from our interactions with the members, but also now uh, dedicating some part of our resource only to writing grants and reaching out uh, to funders to um, find out ways in which we can actually do meaningful work, um, which is financially supported and also builds India chapter and also builds the whole conversation on women leadership, women's engagement and women's health within the global health space. So, so that is one of the learnings that we're having. We're still, uh, you know, in a very, very early stages in uh, of kind of fundraising and any, any kind of, uh, you know, learning, um, for example, attending conferences, meeting people, networking, uh, talking to funding organizations, for example, that panel discussion on um, how can we make, you know, fundraising uh, equivalent, uh, equitable and also the responsibility of donor agencies to foster equitable partnerships. That was very, very critical. So engaging and building our networks and understanding the space and raising funds in a more equitable way. I think that is... Um, yeah, I, I know that doesn't answer your question very directly, but this is where we are. <laughs> Not at all, Deepika. That was uh, quite insightful to know. Moving on, uh, we are at the final question. You are uh, you were awarded the Emerging Voice for Global Health in 2016, and uh, you are also a strong advocate of inclusion practices in public health. So while we are talking about women in leadership, we want to know what comes with that sort of recognition and an achievement which bestows certain critical powers and responsibilities. Because um, and we also want to know how important are such leadership development programs. Um, actually, Emerging Voices, so uh, uh, this is a very interesting question because when we were going through the Emerging Voices program, um, the narrative is that, okay, if you go through the program, um, then do you uh, call yourself emerged? right? Like you, um, you were selected as an emerging voice for global health and you go through a rigorous training program and does that training program make you emerged? Yes, in some way, but no, in so many ways, right? Because we're growing individuals and we're trying to make sense of this complex uh, global health space, the power dynamics and how these different stakeholders engage. And um, so it, I think um, I, I would say that I don't know I'll ever be emerged because there's so much much to unpack, uh, number one. And uh, number two is um, also uh, many times when we, um, uh, I remember that when I completed my PhD program, um, I studied um, RSBY as a um, program and I studied from the perspective of accountability triggering specifically uh, from my own experience that where does citizens um, position come into uh, play. So I was like, okay, now I, I have the skill set of, uh, you know, uh, applying a particular methodology with expertise. I know of how a public health program functions. I just need that one break, one opportunity, one person to trust me and then I'll change the world right but when you come out in reality and you understand the reality is much more harsher right over years working experimenting as a researcher as a consultant faculty implementation person I have come to understand that power and politics run very, very deep into the system that favor certain set of people, right? Without reflecting on the consequential damage that they are doing in the longer run. Uh, and as a woman, uh, the challenges are even multifold because of limited opportunities, because lack of trust in your capabilities, definitely not to trust a young woman to give leadership position. I have experienced that myself. I have felt a lot of times, you know, my um, uh, seniors feeling or other team members feeling threatened because of the opinions or suggestions or, or uh, the opinions that I hold or the suggestions or the points that were I I was putting on the table um, or or generally how I, I carry myself, how I, how, how I vision my uh, contribution to the space. Um, 
and and again that lack of structures and mechanisms that that do not promote women so there are numerous challenges that women face and i mean these are just to name a few the biases that exist because of the age group because of uh, where you are coming from are you married not married specifically in the recruitment and hiring stages so i mean my question is that we need to start thinking of uh, uh, stop saying that you're women, you can't do this. Stop saying women, you're women and you can't access such opportunities, but actually think of creating environments that support and promote women across all life stages, not just, you know, oh, you are young, then, you know, we, we can invest more in you. Or you, if you are mid to senior uh, kind of uh, career stage, then there is more promise to investing in you we have to get away from those and most importantly investing in the young um, emerging uh, women because i think the idea of leadership also is seen very very synonymous with mid or senior career um, women who are either already in leadership positions or about to get into leadership positions. But now the situation has changed completely. A lot of young people are leading initiatives. They're leading um, amazing works. They're uh, leading organizations and movements. So we have to get away with and detach this leadership uh, to be synonymous with age or number of years of experience, right? and start trusting more and more younger people and um, giving them the capacities and skills to lead with grace, to lead with authenticity, to lead with compassion. I think that is what is really needed uh, in the current times. And uh, uh, at WGH India, we're doing a short pilot study um, where we are trying to understand because there's so much uh, being talked about uh, when we say women leadership there's so much about it with respect to the barriers what challenges do they face uh, at the individual level at the uh, institutional level at the societal level but there's very limited that has been talked about say uh, in terms of the efforts that are being made to to uh, address those barriers, right? And most of the times when we talk about how to address those barriers, we, we see that leadership initiatives like uh, Harvard Lead Fellow, like Women Lift Health, there's so many leadership fellow, uh, leadership uh, programs or fellowship programs that exist. But if you notice, and it's very fascinating to see, if you notice that most of these leadership programs target individual level, Right, because, um, and that is also to say, yes, that women uh, as an individual, it, it definitely helps to build your capacity to understand your own strengths and your power and how do you navigate, you know, these spaces that you are in with other powerful actors. Yes, that is definitely helpful. But my question is that uh, why are there no um, uh, or very limited efforts which are not yet visible or not yet documented which are happening at the institutional level. Some of the initiatives that were kind of uh, brought up at the conference last week, right? Like for example, Good Business Lab and uh, so many other uh, initiatives, but it needs to transcend those handful of two, three, four, five organizations that have initiated, you know, reflecting on their organization culture, on their belief system, on the practices and integrating those structures and processes into place that make this, you know, an acceptable norm that yes, uh, doesn't matter if you are uh, pregnant, um, we will hire you and we will provide you all the support. Doesn't matter if you are, you have a six month old kid, we will uh, hire you and we'll provide you all the support that is needed. Uh, or if you are irrespective at any career stage, at any uh, personal stage, uh, we will be, uh, as long as uh, you bring value to the table, we'll be very happy to support you with all our heart. So that is what I think is really needed and is 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 missing. 
so yeah thank you once again uh, especially for having such a candid and vulnerable conversation with us on leadership mental health the importance of infrastructure and societal support to advance equity in public health but uh, also most importantly for highlighting the need to create and invest in community and peer support within the sector personally for me that has been the biggest takeaway from this conversation with you today thank you thank you for the opportunity i really enjoyed the conversation really appreciate this thank you uh thank you everyone for staying with us till the end we'll be back soon with more episodes where we discuss other pertinent themes around gender equity and women in leadership stay tuned